Robert Winston is a professor of science and society here at Imperial College, as well as an emeritus professor of fertility studies. He runs a research program in the Institute of Reproductive and Developmental Biology and has almost 300 scientific publications on reproduction and embryology. He is a man committed to scientific education. He has written many books and hosts many TV shows, which I'm sure you've all seen, including Child of Our Time and the BAFTA award winning The Human Body. He also speaks in the House of Lords, where he speaks regularly on education, science, medicine, and the arts. He is Imperial College's very own celebrity, and the sight of him around campus is still enough to make undergraduate heads turn. He is a man who takes Movember to the next level. It is an absolute honour to have him here today, and please give him a warm welcome, Professor Lord Robert Winston. We've got there. All right. Um, first of all, let me say um, what a real uh, pleasure, indeed a privilege it is, to speak today. And I apologize for not being for the whole meeting, but I've been flitting around the country doing so many different things, and I've only just managed to get here this afternoon. But um, I really want to congratulate you on holding this meeting. Um, it seems to me to have been a very important thing to have done. And I'm going to um, start with this image. Um, if you, um, it's very, very dim, isn't it? There's such bright light up here. Anyhow, you can probably see, I hope you can. This, this vast structure, which is clad with two foot of concrete, um, is pierced by 192 holes in different parts. And it is uh, about uh, 10 meters across. And in the center of it is this gantry, which is swung in before the start of any experiment with a tiny capsule on the end. Here, they're just adjusting things with a piece of engineering. Some of you will know already what this is. But when the alarm bells are sounded and the concrete doors are slammed shut, there are 192 ports, as I say, for the most powerful lasers in the world. And when they're pulsed on, they're actually briefly uh, using more energy or producing more energy than the entire national grid of the United States of America, about 6,000 times more, actually. And they're all focused on this one point uh, here, this whole round, this hollow capsule, which is gold-coated and which contains a tiny pellet, two millimeters across, of deuterium oxide. And this, of course, is a nuclear fusion experiment because when the lasers are pulsed on with that massive amount of energy, there is uh, production of X-rays here, uh, perturbation and compression of the droplet of water, which is frozen right down to minus 200 degrees Celsius, rapid heating up to the temperature of the sun. Protons start to fuse. And of course, more energy is released than is used in the experiment. This is nuclear fusion. The advantage, of course, at least in theory, is first of all, this is a relatively carbon neutral. And there are something like 7,000 years worth of deuterium in ordinary seawater. And of course, the amount of nuclear waste which is produced is uh, A, relatively short-lived, and B, trivial compared with what is used uh, even in uh, fourth generation uh, nuclear fission reactors. So in a sense, this uh, experiment, uh, which is still going on in Livermore and which is not producing much energy, even though uh, it's learning quite a lot about lasers, um, is uh, one example of how we're struggling to find ways of dealing uh, with uh, the issue of human uh, products of burning uh, uh, carbon fuels, fossil fuels. It is of interest to me for none of those reasons. It's of interest to me because the special theory of relativity was in 1905 when Einstein la laid down the possibility of um, photons being used in this kind of way, although it's purely a theoretical construct. And it was 50 years later when the first optical lasers were actually built. This was a ruby laser. So that's about 52 years ago. And what's um, 
extraordinary, of course, is that at the time, nobody really had a good use for the laser. When you consider it now, uh, the laser is something you all use when you check out of a supermarket because it reads the barcode when you've stolen the goods or you're not paying for the goods or whatever. It's capable of sealing a detached retina at the back of the eye. It's capable of being used in intra-abdominal surgery. I use it in my own uh, laboratory on a daily basis as a confocal microscope. We all use it, of course, to uh, communicate across the world with uh, the internet. And we use the laser, of course, moreover, um, with a DVD or a CD. And in due course, there are improvements in computing where the laser is going to be, I think, increasingly important. So the first thing to say about this remarkable invention, in my view, one of the 10 great inventions of the last 50 or so years, is that its application was really completely unenvisaged. And uh, almost so, anyway. And the second thing is, uh, I think, quite interesting about it, is that when I asked Ed Moses, who's the director of the Livermore Institute, where this piece of research is going on, and which actually has not produced uh, energy, perhaps a little bit unlike um, our own experiments at Cullum, which at least, I think, look rather more, um, rather more probable. Um, when, uh, Ed, when I asked Ed Moses this, he leant across against the side of the machine and he said, well, it's easy, isn't it? It's all part of our nuclear weapons program. And that's another interesting aspect to this technology because it has a downside, which of course is also not um, expected. And it's my view that all technologies have downsides. After all, if climate change is caused by human activity, then certainly our experiments with agriculture and our use of fuel, fuels during the uh, Industrial Revolution and the technology which came from that are very, very good examples of that downside. My great-grandfather is depicted in this photograph. And my great-great-grandfather would have walked between villages in Ramsgate in a way that my great-grandfather didn't, great didn't envisage. He was rich enough to have a horse and cart, and the whole family could travel in and out of Ramsgate. By the time of my grandfather's time, um, here he is in, um, just across the way in, in the park, and he's actually driving uh, a, a motor car in about 1902. Um, not so dissimilar from the motor car which is owned by the students of Imperial College, the brown motor car, although this is a little bit smaller and slightly less elaborate. My mother bought her first car when I was about 12 years old, and it was um, a Ford Prefect. It went a great deal faster, of course, um, and was reasonably reliable. Uh, incidentally, we called it mushroom-colored, not because that was in the catalog, but because there wasn't mushroom inside it. But the curious thing, of course, is that this change in transport means that now we actually all fly. And what I, think is what I think is curious about this is not so much the issue of the change in carbon emissions, but the fact that this technology also has another downside, which actually is never really mentioned. Perhaps one of the great threats facing humankind at the moment is the spread of infection. Interestingly, not bacteria, but probably viruses. And here is some rather nice data which have been worked up and produced in Nature. And recently, the Sanger Institute uh, in, uh, in, in Cambridge has been doing some work in this area. And you can see that, in fact, if you take all the waves of cholera that have come out of, uh, that have crossed the planet, have all started from one epicenter. And that is, I think, of great importance because it argues that there are completely unexpected and largely unpredictable aspects to the technology that we use. And of course, if this is um, taken now, not so much, of course, cholera, because cholera obviously is waterborne, but it would apply to all sorts of mutated viruses and other bacteria as well. And with air transport, of course, we're made vulnerable because you and I would have no uh, natural resistance to relatively new mutations of organisms which are formed, for example, in this part of the world. 
Very curiously, you might have thought that this was a new piece of information generated as a result, it, result of sequencing the genome of Vibrio cholerae. Actually, what's curious and impressive is that we had that information years and years ago. This is in the 1830s when people mapped the spread of cholera and identified it as coming actually from the same part of Bangladesh um, at that time. So information is often lost and forgotten and then regenerated. And I think it's an important scientific principle. You may think, well, where am I getting to with climate change? I hope you'll bear with me just uh, a, a little longer. One extraordinary example of uh, public consciousness is shown by this, um, this piece of work done by the Wellcome Trust. And it turns out that one of the areas that we, uh, we humans have really failed uh, to really uh, get an understanding of with other humans is the, the amount of need we have for animal research. We talk a great deal about replacing animals, but actually we probably need to use more animals in research now to generate the medicines we need than ever before. When uh, people, when members of the public were asked whether it was acceptable to operate on a human volunteer for research, 80% yes, said yes, but only 63% said it was uh, appropriate to do so with bacteria. A very, very curious answer. And what do these polls mean? Well, one thing I mean is that they're deeply unreliable. And the other issue, of course, is that really quite intelligent people and well-educated people don't always actually perceive the science we do, even when they're involved with technology themselves, as being actually as it is. Here's a very good example. This photograph of Steve Jobs was taken not so long before he was diagnosed um, with uh, pancreatic cancer. And it's curious to consider that this individual, who was technologically highly literate, scientifically obviously literate, uh, refused any um, evidence-based medicine for so long that there was absolutely no chance of the treatments for his cancer actually working. And he died, of course, um, only um, a year or two after, uh, after, after diagnosis was made. Possibly, had he been treated promptly, uh, with the new drugs which are now available, this might have been a very different story. And that extraordinary skepticism is something which none of us, I think, are completely, um, are completely un, uh, unaffected by. Uh, uh, and I think this is something, we talk about the public, but we don't actually regard ourselves as part of the public. Uh, let me now deal with some aspect of media pronouncements. And you'll see where I'm going, I think, more clearly here. This next video was a video of an announcement made on the 26th of June in the year 2000 by President Clinton. Um, and here it is. So here we Ladies have- Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States accompanied by Dr. Francis Collins and Dr. J. Craig Venter. So we have Francis Collins coming in on the right of our picture, looking rather pleased with himself. There he is. And Craig Venter looking really rather embarrassed about being there, which is quite interesting. Now, this has been a repeatedly broadcast tape. I won't for a moment show you what the president said, but I'll show you another clip. You may know, of course, that Francis Collins is a deeply committed Christian, and he was responsible for, the, for running the American sequencing, uh, whilst in Britain, of course, in the UK, the Wellcome Trust did 25% of the sequencing at the Wellcome Institute. And on this side, of course, Craig Venter did this as a purely private arrangement. And one, uh, one genome was published in Science and one public was published in Nature. Um, 
Let's look at the same video again, but this time uh, this is a religious broadcast made in Britain, and you'll see some striking differences in it. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by Dr. Francis Collins. Craig Venter doesn't appear. We're here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. Today, we are learning the language in which God created life. When you look at the sequence of the human genome, our own instruction book, these three billion letters that determine all of the biological attributes of a human being, it's a pretty awesome experience. After all, out of this research, most of us believe we will arrive at cures for terrible diseases that we currently don't have much to offer for. And I think our strongest mandate down through the centuries of the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, one of the strongest mandates, is healing. It's going to make more difference than any other single scientific advance for doctors like me and for medical scientists. It will completely revolutionize the way that people investigate and treat human disease. Instead of wandering around looking for treatments, as happened with antibiotics or stumbling across them, we'll have a map in our hand. When you try to work out what range of illnesses will be influenced by the Human Genome Project, the only one that might not be is traffic accidents. And that's a very interesting clip for lots of reasons. But it's interesting, first of all, because actually it's possible that sequencing of the human genome of somebody, it may be only traffic accidents which are actually predictable. We know that diseases in general are not predictable from the genetic sequence now, uh, 13 years later. And it turns out to be a great deal more complicated. It's also interesting what President Clinton said. He said that this is the most important map ever drawn by mankind, the language, he goes on to talk about the language of God. Well, I'm not going to comment on the language of God, but it is interesting to consider that the map of Washington, the A to Z of Washington, is probably a darn sight more useful at the present time than the sequence of the human genome. And on the line at the other end during that broadcast, which I haven't shown you, was Tony Blair saying that this achievement tells us more about our humanity than any previous human endeavor. My argument would be that in 1599, when Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, that was arguably rather more important in our humanity. Now, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that grossly exaggerated claims like this, which are made for respect of scientists, on behalf of scientists, by scientists themselves, and by politicians, are not actually particularly helpful to science. And that, I think, is a real issue in the problem of climate change. One of the key issues is that if we're really to have climate change fully understood, then we need to be looking at these sorts of issues on a more wide scale and look at, actually, the, the issue of behavior change. And I think that's one of the points that is really worth making in this short presentation. For example, we now know, after this publication of half a dozen papers in Nature and three or four in Science and one or two in Cell just five weeks ago, that this sequence um, is really hugely complicated, that whilst we've only got 20,000 genes in the human alphabet, we have just so far discovered over three million microRNAs which change the function of all these genes very substantially under different environmental circumstances. And therefore, whilst before we might have blithely thought that we would be able to compute um, and use informatics to use the genome, it seems now that that idea, which should have never really been, I think, quite as prominent as it was, uh, it should recede. I'm not saying that the sequencing of the genome shouldn't have been done or it wasn't useful, but it certainly is by no means the most important development in biology 
uh, in recent years as has been claimed. And it's, I think, going to haunt us later on as biologists. For example, within a day of the ENCODE data being published, we saw this in the Sun, and it was repeated in the Daily Telegraph and other newspapers, that we'll now be able to make babies that will live a great deal longer as a result of this groundbreaking research, that they'll all be able to live beyond the age of 100, and we'll be able to choose what kind of health they have, what kind of physique, and what kind of looks our babies have as a result of this. It's actually complete nonsense. Another issue is that we live in, and this I think is very important for climate change, we live in a mathematically illiterate environment. The standard of mathematics in this country, as it is in most countries, is not good. But in Britain, for example, something like 50,000 children leave school without um, uh, 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 a D to G in GCSE mathematics. That astonishingly high level of basic illiteracy is something that should worry us. This is a, um, a headline which intrigued me from the independent newspaper. It sounds really quite worrying that two and a half million men in Britain might be infertile. Let's say there are around 60 million people in Britain, of which 20 million are likely to be male, exclude 10 million, it's actually much higher than that, who are under 20 years, probably nearer 18 million. Another 10 million or more who are over 50, that means at the most there are 10 million males at risk, probably a good deal fewer. Let's say half of them have female partners and half of them are trying at present. That actually means that every British man is infertile. <laughs> and of course, that is, I think, a serious issue for us, as, as, uh, for you as mainly physical scientists. Uh, and this is something which crops up in different ways um, in headlines. Some years ago, this was published in the Daily Mail, that 14 women had died in the smear scandal because it was obvious to anybody who was really just reading the newspaper on the top of the Clapham omnibus that you could tell the difference between a cancer smear and a normal smear. There's a notion, of course, that science is black and white, that diagnosis is either yes or no, completely forgetting, of course, that we live in science in all sorts of gradations of, of um, inexactitude to some extent and certainly um, incompleteness with our data. And that, I think, is um, an issue which we've not always been able to, to get across in our understanding. Two other issues about scientists, very briefly. This is my friend Richard Dawkins, who I admire and like and respect greatly. One of our best writers in English, his book on the selfish gene, which he wrote many years ago, I think is one of the great classics of popular biology writing. But here he is as a committed atheist, um, a bit like Craig Venter, incidentally, but rather more public about it, standing by a London bus which has been labeled, there's probably no God, so stop worrying. Well, it rather ignores the data. It turns out that most people who, are, who believe in God tend to have slightly lower anxiety le levels than those who don't. Um, so I don't know what Polly Toynbee thinks she's doing standing there, or indeed, for that matter, his rather attractive PhD student. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but let's look at that in just brief detail. I mean, that's pretty innocuous. So what? What does it matter? It's not really doing much harm. And yet, it polarizes opinion. It's a very real issue for us looking at climate science. That's OK. But do we find this bus quite so acceptable? Or this bus? Then we start to feel, actually, that actually this kind of misinformation is actually deeply damaging. And in my view, to argue that there's such a thing as a God delusion, as he did with the title of his book, whilst whatever one may say about his book, good or bad, that kind of argument is, in my view, in some ways puerile and dangerous for a scientist, because actually it argues if you don't believe in my science, if you don't believe in my view, then in some way you are deluded. You are not actually as intellectually complete as I am. And that, I think, is something which we need to be very care careful about. The other issue is 
so-called scientists, who are not real scientists, but pretending to be scientists, one classic example at the moment is Ben Goldacre. Now, I know what I'm going to say may sound libelous, but actually his present campaign against the pharmaceutical industry with his latest book is, I think, really quite dishonest because it doesn't portray the whole picture. I've got a number of sound clips of him here uh, claiming that he's a scientist and a doctor um, and a social scientist and all the rest of it. Um, but actually, when you look actually at what he's published, you realize that there's about, I think, two or maybe three peer-reviewed publications, none of which he's either lead or senior author, and none of which actually give any credibility to the views which he publicly espouses. And I think that people who claim to know more about the subject and who pronounce public, publicly in a very popular way as Goldacre does can occasionally do massive harm to important subjects, as I think he will be doing, undoubtedly, to one of our most important industries, the pharmaceutical industry. And I don't speak with any kind of, um, of uh, interest in pharmaceuticals myself, so I don't have a vested interest here. Uh, let me just move one, on quickly. How did you become such Sorry, a vocal this is just critic of bad speaking. science as you see it? I, 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 I should have cut him out really completely. Now, one of the recent publications which has a social science bent about climate change is that of Sharples. And these data are pretty complicated to uh, look at. But what I've done is I've, I've emboldened the main uh, areas of agreement and disagreement in people that, um, that uh, Sharples has interviewed. Um, I think that these figures on the whole are really quite encouraging because um, a large number of people certainly uh, really want to climb, uh, uh, tackle uh, climate change, but still we have a number of people who think it's a myth, about one third of um, responders, and um, a, a number of people still, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, they disagree that it's a myth, so, they, so actually about, so a large number um, think that actually there's something to climate change and a large number think that um, uh, climate change is, uh, is really contributed by humans in the negative. And um, also many people feel that they would like to change their habits if they could do. Most people feel that neither government nor international governments nor businesses nor local authorities are doing sufficient um, about trying to change it. And um, most people overall, at least 53%, let's say, disagree with the view that it's too late to change attitudes now. Most people feel actually that that is not true. When we look at their questioning six experts in climate change, and some of you may be familiar with this paper, you'll see that the experts themselves are absolutely certain that there's no doubt that climate change is real, that this view is shared by all their peers. Um, they feel it's vital the public's informed, but most of them feel the public are not informed. Uh, are there specific to bar barriers to engagement? They feel all of them are. Um, is there any doubt that climate change is real? No doubt, virtually no doubt at all, except one or two questions here. Uh, are there some groups manipulating the issue? Uh, i.e. implying some dishonesty, indeed the answer is yes. Um, is this detracting or causing confusion? The answer the scientists feel is yes. And is there enough reliable information out there? Um, um, most people feel there is. One scientist was not sure and one says no. Now, when the scientists were asked to speak about where they felt the main issues were, it's quite interesting that um, two identified a communication problem. Um, four out of six thought there was confusion in the technology that was used, in, the, in the terminology that was used. Um, about half of them felt that people were mis misunderstood the complexity of the issues. Um, one felt, uh, most people felt, most of the scientists felt there were issues of public trust. Only one didn't feel that. Um, uh, most scientists also felt the media were a bad influence. 
um, that um, political influence wasn't very helpful, that there was polarization of debate in some cases. But interestingly, um, when it came to education, um, that was hardly really thought about in the polls. These, um, in, in their poll, most scientists didn't raise the issue of education as being important particularly at all. Um, one study by Nick Pigeon's group, and I rather thought that he might be invited here today because I think one of the issues is really trying to have a discussion like this without qualified uh, social scientists. They recently published Climate Science, the Public and News Media, and they looked at a number of focus groups. Strikingly, um, they are all adults. Nobody actually looked at children. Um, the key messages in their report say that less than half the UK public say that they know a fair amount about climate change or are likely to read about it. There's also a marked note of skepticism and that actually levels of concern have actually decreased rather than increased in the last five years and people feel that the problems have been exaggerated. Um, the trust in scientists has also uh, decreased. About 30% of the UK public apparently don't trust the scientists according to their, their studies. And pretty self-evident that an individual's beliefs, politics, and personal values, worldview are likely to contribute to those attitudes. Um, they go on to report that we certainly need to engage the public, and I agree with that absolutely, and this is really where I want to conclude uh, very quickly. It's very clear that there are all sorts of ways we can uh, c uh, contribute better. Talented communicators, they argue, embed the concerns of climate scientists in broader messages. So when we're talking about science, when I'm talking about biology, I often use climate science, for example, in my talks, so the public um, in context of, of the wider issues in biology, uh, two-way engagement. What they don't really talk about is listening to the public, which I feel is um, uh, uh, irritating because I think that's something we could do much more. Um, they, sh they, they argue you should accommodate literacy, use simple language and greater clarity, uh, not use alarmist or manipulative language, and the scientists to work in collaboration with others like social scientists and be clearer about the use of misconstrued language. And then their document ends up with this comment, which rather destroys the whole point. More needs to be done to better understand the, the attitudinal differences across the population in relation to the complexities of travel choices to enable the consideration and development of targeted policy and communications. Well, it makes you lose the will to live when you read that in a document which is designed by social scientists to try to encourage clarity of expression. And it's a key issue for us as scientists. You know, we are all, social scientists and physical scientists and biological scientists are not really training ourselves in communication. And in my view, that is an essential. Now, what's so exciting about you people is that you have um, a clear recognition of the need for that to change. And that is something which you need to go out, I think, and do. You need to learn, I think, all sorts of ways of how you can communicate. In my view, if we're really going to change our society, we need to do it in a way that we've not been doing. I find it worrying, for example, that every Secretary of State for Education fiddles with secondary schools and changes the curriculum with different demands on students. In my view, to some extent, secondary education should be left to fend for itself, as universities should be left to be relatively independent. Where we really need to target, in my view, is with primary schools and with preschools. I think there's a vast amount that we could do to really change our society if we were able to communicate at the level needed with an eight-year-old. It's actually far more difficult to teach science to an eight-year-old than a 16-year-old. I know that from my own experience. I mean, this week, I think I've lectured to about 5,500 school students. Very easy, because they were all at GCSE level. But with a primary school, it has to be a much smaller group. There has to be much more personal contact. And there needs to be far more interaction between you as a teacher, often talking outside your comfort zone, because small children ask very imponderable questions. But we need to be teaching our children
to debate. Now, this is an example of what we're doing at Imperial College. This is the Reach Out Lab, where we bring kids in every day of the week, both in the school holidays and, um, and um, outside um, uh, and during term time. They come in in classes, and they'll do, for example, a dissection, or they'll do um, a climate change experiment. Um, and um, okay, here, in fact, they're about to do um, a carbon capture experiment with Nick Gibb, who's the uh, education minister who's now left his post. There's a little bang in a minute because um, the bottle of carbon dioxide exploded. And these are pellets which he'd never seen carbon dioxide, ice. He flinched them because of the pop. But you see, the extraordinary thing is that an education minister who had no concept that carbon dioxide ice might roll around. But when the kids do this and they use carbon capture in the laboratory and then walk across the corridor to the carbon capture machine that we have at Imperial College, that's something that universities can do increasingly by opening themselves up much more, making that barrier free. So we use our big plants, our big installation, to show school children actually the relevance of that science. And that's something that we need to be doing, I think, as people who are at university. Now, for those of you who are at Imperial College and want to come and work with me in the Reach Out Lab, believe me, you're always welcome uh, if you want to get in contact. Um, one of the things we've been doing, for example, in biology, is doing a dissection of a rat. And then in the morning, we do a rat dissection. And then in the afternoon, they scrub up and they do a human operation. Okay, there's quite a lot of blood in here. Let's, uh, let's get this one. Yeah, Morris, Morris to Jimmy, please. And Generally, it's a knife wound. Well, right, so on. it's fairly hairy. Bleeding everywhere. You see what I'm doing? Okay, really swabs, get the swabs and when you look carefully, you can see, actually, this is just a photograph of an anaesthetic machine. So it's not a real operating coat, it's in the same laboratory. Suddenly this patient has a cardiac arrest. So we can show leadership of the team in time. And we now have uh, iPods, which will, iPads, which will simulate what's happening to the patient's blood pressure, pulse, and so on, and vital signs. And it gets bloodier and bloodier. The patient doesn't die. Actually, there's the patient uh, here. And, and here are children, quite young children, watching this. And believe me, at the end of this demonstration, once they've, especially if they've scrubbed up, which we're increasingly trying to get them to do, they either absolutely want to be in biomedicine in some way, or they go and vomit in a corner. <laughs> and the first time we did this in the lab, we had this very, very realistic doll. I mean, he's absolutely realistic. He breathes, he coughs, he's intubated here. And when um, we were so pleased with what had happened that late afternoon, we were a bit late, we finished at about 6.30. We then had a drink in the lab. We went home and left this corpse under a sheet um, in the lab, having not completely cleaned up. At, at um, 6 o'clock in the morning, my phone rang at home, and apparently security said there was a, a cleaner running across the courtyard outside with having, having hysterics because somebody had committed a murder in my laboratory. <laughs> um, so she was engaged in a sense as well. But I think you can see uh, the point of this. In, in my view, we have to do much more to teach debate, to try to teach more about the real concepts of science than we do at all levels. But I think particularly if we're really going to make a massive difference in primary schools. I very quickly set up here seven aphorisms of science in conclusion which might be intriguing to you. I'm going to suggest to you that the announcements of most discoveries are usually heralded by exaggerated claims for their own importance. That's probably true of a whole range of technologies in climate change. For example, maybe, for example, carbon capture. We'll have to see. But that is, I think, something worth pondering about. Secondly, nearly all technological advances have threatening aspects which are unrecognized at the time of the invention. The point I'm trying to make is that we need to be a great deal more modest 
about our role. And we need to be much more prepared to listen to the arguments because then I think we're far more likely to have an effect. It's very interesting. We've been evaluating what's going on with the school kids and I have a PhD student doing that at the moment. I could show you the detail, but actually already the follow-ups are showing extremely encouraging signs when we get them to debate these issues. Most discoveries have beneficial applications which weren't actually envisaged because the uh, discovery was made in some other context. And um, we constantly, as I said, reinvent the same advances. And sadly, uh, even democratic governments can't be trusted. When the public don't trust governments, that's not actually unreasonable. Governments don't use science wisely. They use science again and again where they think it will be of benefit to their vote or to their support and to um, uh, perhaps their public, uh, their public position rather than actually have a scientific uh, knowledge uh, might be used in a longer term basis. So I think we need to be fairly independent, in my view, of government. It's very good having chief scientific advisors and research councils which use the Haldane principle, but that Haldane principle is very important and it shouldn't be tampered with. And increasingly, of course, it is. The current government, for example, is doing that a bit with its graphene um, uh, funding. No matter what is claimed, as scientists, we're not entirely ob objective. We get very excited by what we do. We get very, very seduced by what we do. And lastly, and most important, history shows very clearly that we scientists cannot predict the future. In fact, it will be true to say that most of the scientists you've been listening to over the weekend, the prominent scientists, will be phoned up in the next week or two by the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, the Times, the Observer, the Telegraph, to be asked what is going to be, your most imp what is going to be the most important scientific discovery made in the next 12 months, Christmas publication. And the answer, of course, is that really, if we're honest, none of us know. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I would just say uh, one thing, that if you've got questions that there isn't time to ask me, if you want to email me on the Imperial College server, it's r.winston at imperial.ac.uk, and I'll do my best to answer um, any issues that you have or criticisms you have of what I said. And if there's anybody who's got one or two quick questions now, if we have the lights up, if, if that's all right with you, you guys. Okay. Um, if not, oh well, there's one over there. Let me come down. Hi, thank you uh, very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, in an earlier talk yesterday on communicating, communicating climate change, uh, Dr. Alice Bell, who is at Sussex University, she talked about. Um, how, for example, if you think about biomedicine, the Wellcome Trust has quite a well-established um, graduate program and they have a whole big department that's all about communication and engagement and so on. Um, but if, if, when we think about climate change, there really isn't something like that. So where do you think funding for that kind of, you know, sort of fostering well, the new, new it, generation of, of it's, climate it's change. It's a great, great question, thank you. Um, I, first of all, um, I have to say I think, I have to say this a bit carefully because I owe my career to the Wellcome Trust. I was a Wellcome Research Fellow and I had numerous uh, research grants from them over the years. But the Wellcome Trust is quite capable of talking itself up a bit. And mm -hmm. some of its public engagement stuff has not been particularly successful, and others of it has not been well validated. Some has and some hasn't. It's improving all the time. But of course, uh, climate change is absolutely relevant to the objectives of the Wellcome Trust because the Wellcome Trust is essentially involved with biology. So what happens in Africa is of great importance to, to us as biologists, and so the Wellcome Trust should be a focus much more, I think, for uh, climate change. And one of the arguments you might uh, suggest, or one might suggest, is that actually it's really rather deficient um, if it doesn't deal uh, 
with these sorts of things. In my view, we should be looking at these things um, in the totality because there are clear arguments, clear procedural issues which could be collectively learned, whether it's animal research, climate change, nuclear fission, uh, nothing, nothing to do with the climate change aspect of nuclear fission, of course, but simply its safety and use and so on. And I think that we're not doing that very well. I don't think anybody is doing that particularly well. What should we be doing? Well, the Research Council started to do this. EPSRC was particularly, I think, really ahead of the game. In my view, it was the best body doing it. But when the cuts came with this government, that program went. And I think that was a massive error. I think it was difficult for EPSRC, but the trouble is when, when you know, the big universities are facing, facing perhaps a 20% cut or more in research funding and you're not able to produce enough research graduates, uh, you know, it's inevitable that public engagement will be the first to suffer. Um, what else could be done? Government. Um, Science-wise is one such uh, place which has not been particularly well funded. It's also had its funding cut. I think there's a very strong case for much more central uh, aspect. And you know what? Your question is really important because what is quite shocking is that every department of government, except one, culture, media, and sport, has a scientific advisor. Admittedly, the treasury doesn't. It has an economist, unbelievably. It doesn't think science is important. But there isn't a single social science advisor to government in that, at the same level. And that must be wrong because, of course, our policies have to depend on actually how the public perceive them. So yours is a fantastic question. Thank you. Maybe I'll take one more if anybody's got one. I don't, I'm really worried about keeping you too long. No? Where are you? Up there. Uh, thank you for a lovely talk. Um, Rene Lertzman is a, an American psychologist um, who published a very interesting study recently uh, about um, the, some of the psychological um, aspects um, of public perception of climate change. Uh, and she, she did a great talk at UCL just last week, and one of her messages to us was not to ever use the word barrier. Uh, we keep on talking about these political barriers, these uh, social barriers to uh, engagement with climate change and things like that. Uh, and her study was all about um, her study was all about actually the confusion that most people perceive when it comes to climate change, uh, conflicts of, of answers to questions. And you pointed that out wonderfully in your talk. Thank you. Uh, and she actually likened the situation much more to a tangle. Uh, and that the, she, she really made a case of the, the psychological uh, implications of this word barrier and how people perceive it. So her alternative perception of these barriers that we perceive is, is to use this concept of a tangle. I was wondering um, what your alternative to this concept of barrier would be. I think that's a lovely idea. I mean, I wish I'd heard it. Um, it's not something I've really thought about. Um, I mean, one of the concerns, of course, is this issue of, of uncertainty, too. It's one of those sort of, that's almost a sort of barrier, too, because we don't get that across well. Um, and, of course, governments deal with that very badly as well. I'm not sure I've got a good analogy like the candle. I wish I had. Um, hmm? A tangle. A tangle. A tangle. A knots. Yes. Well, maybe. Maybe that's right. Um, but I suppose, you know, one, I mean, I think one of the ways is to skirt around the problem because actually all of you, you know, you people are here at a weekend because you're so massively committed. And, the, you know, for example, when I go around Imperial and, 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 and talk to some of the PhD students who are doing stuff which is related to climate change, I, I find them mind-blowingly exciting people because they're very altruistic. They're not trying to proselytize. They're not trying to exaggerate. Um, they don't, but they also perceive a barrier because they feel that their concerns are not being addressed particularly by the media. And that's the barrier that they see. And indeed, recently I brought one of my television producer friends in to talk to a couple of PhD students here because I felt that really there would be a fantastic program to make. Well, he went away, he looked at the stuff that they were doing, 
stuff looking at climate change over the last 50 million years, as it turns out, from drill holes in the seafloor and so on. But what is impressive is the reaction to this when it comes to our public broadcasting system. There's the barrier. Because the BBC won't tackle stuff where it thinks the public isn't capable of actually understanding it. And that's a nonsense because, of course, any scientific concept is capable of being understood because science actually at least is rational, um, except when you get to quantum mechanics. Perhaps that's not entirely rational, but that's another issue. But I think, I think perhaps one of the barriers, actually, is how we, uh, if we, if we must use that word, is actually really where we try to persuade our friends in the media that they've, they've got an opportunity to do something really important, but which they're not doing. Um, it doesn't answer your question, um, but it raises yet another barrier, actually. In my view, it's one of the most important ones. So what do you do? I think so many of you should be going into schools, actually. And I think there are more and more universities realize this, there are programs there to be done. And I think that's one of the most exciting things that we can all do. Um, you know, I, I have a fairly busy diary, but I tend to prioritize schools in my own, in my own case. Um, and I think we maybe should be doing that more and more. I think that's all, you know, some of us won't want to communicate, some of us won't be particularly good communicators, but most of us can learn how to communicate. And most of us can actually, I think, communicate those issues that we feel passionate about. And you're here because you feel passionate. And that's fantastic. So I hope that you think about those educational issues in that way. And um, then that barrier will recede. Thank you.